Well, it's 2.02. I will continue to be letting folks in. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know it is a wonderful day outside, but thank you all for being here. Um, I'm so excited to have Nikki Caruso here to present the history of New Orleans Fire Department. Um, we've been able to do a lot of great work with the fire department and Nikki's been instrumental in getting some of the um, historic day books from all the engine houses to the city archives, which is where I work. Um, my name is Amanda Fallis. I guess I should tell you that. I'm a city archivist and um, I've been working with uh, the fire department and fire department families such as Nikki and um, also the crew thirds to get some historic fire books and to make sure they come to the city archives where they belong so future generations can read them and experience the history of the fire department. Um, I was really blessed to meet Nikki and see her speak at the Deutsches House and I really wanted her to be able to public uh, to publicly present for the city archives and we decided to do this zoom um little housekeeping for today's program basically i will let nikki give her presentation y'all are free to type in chat if you have any questions and what i'll do is i will write them down and i will ask them in order at the end and then at the end when we do the q a session i'll also allow y'all if you want to to raise your hand or um, type in chat and i can turn allow y'all to turn your cameras on if you're more comfortable asking the question vocally as opposed to typing it in the chat either way um this will be recorded and um, I will be putting it up on the city YouTube. Everybody who's registered for this, whether they were able to make it today or not, will be getting an email when I've got the uh, when I've got the uh, video edited and posted on our um, city archives website. Let me drop that city archives website in the chat really quick so y'all can bookmark and subscribe if you want to. Just one moment. Okay. Sorry, clicking on it, and then I'm going to copy and paste it to y'all. Okay, so I am dropping a link in the chat to the uh, YouTube channel if y'all want to bookmark that for later, but either way, you will be getting an email if you registered. And um, so I think that handles all the housekeeping. Um, with that being said, I would love to turn it over to you, Nikki, if you'd like to introduce yourself and get started. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me today. Thank all of you for sh um, showing up, <laughs> I guess. Um, and my name is Nikki Caruso, um, and you might be wondering what my connection is to the fire department. Um, my dad's a retired New Orleans firefighter. He was on the department for 33 years. Um, he was always very interested in its history. I am interested in history. I have a master's degree in American dance studies from Florida State, which is basically dance history with research in it. Um, so during the pandemic, I was stuck in the house like everyone else. And I just started, decided to start looking for old firehouses in the city. And um, I looked through Sanborn maps, really using the library's resources and all of those lovely things. Um, but kind of let me get myself back on track. So today I'm gonna to talk about the story of fire protection in the fire department in the city starting kind of in 1771. Um, we're gonna look at how it evolves out of this community obligation, kind of like jury duty into a robust volunteer force and then eventually a paid department. Um, along the way, I'm going to talk about technological innovations, as well as social and cultural aspects of the department, and I'm going to wrap it up in 1922, which is a really big period of change for the fire department. Um, so kind of going back a bit, my dad was on the fire department, he was interested in history. Um, so I started going around, I was finding these old firehouses, like you can see, and kind of putting the photo of what it used to look like in 1895 over what the station looks like today. And then I would research the history of that station and the history of the company and just do a little post on Instagram, kind of something to do to keep myself occupied. Um, so that became Crescent City Stations on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then a retired fireman who's friends with my dad uh, named Gary Savell. He asked me to give a presentation at the Deutsches House, which is where I met Amanda, and kind of how we made that connection, which is really exciting. 
Um, when I do my research, I have a particular book that I go to, one New Orleans Fire Department history that I use as a springboard. But I overwhelmingly use primary sources that are available through the library's online databases that you can see here. Um, I also use materials from the Historic New Orleans Collections online catalog, and then other online databases like Fire Engineering. Um, there's a database called Hathi Trust that I use a lot, Library of Congress. And what I really try to do is look at these primary sources. So I'm getting firsthand accounts of the events as they happened, recorded as time goes on. That way you're not kind of getting a diluted memory of an event. Um, I also have a few go-to books that I use, secondary sources to fill in the gaps. One of them is The American Firehouse by Rebecca Zurier. Um, and then New Orleans 1867, which is a collection of photographs by Theodore Lilienthal. And then I also really use fire department yearbooks um, just to kind of look at locations over time, what stations look like and whatnot. Um, but the book that I referenced about New Orleans Fire Department history that's going to come up all throughout this presentation is called The History of the Fire Department of New Orleans from the Earliest Days to the Present Time. And it was edited and written by Thomas O'Connor, who was the chief engineer of the New Orleans Fire Department for many years. He published this in 1895. And it's his account of history of the department as a whole, as well as a really great collection of profiles of men who were on the department at the time and photographs of the companies in front of their houses in 1895. It's 564 pages long, and it's just this really wonderful, invaluable history written by the man who perhaps more than anyone kind of shaped the department, made it what it is today, and then led it through all these periods of great change. All of that said, utmost respect to Thomas O'Connor. It has some flaws, which I think are important to acknowledge. Um, his biases are present when, for example, it comes to the histories of companies or events that he didn't really like. Um, stories will be underdocumented, or he can just kind of feel like an unreliable narrator. He was super proud of the department. And he always wanted to paint the firemen and the department in a really positive light um, for the sake of posterity, of course. So his account events don't always align what's, with what's reported in newspapers. So there are a couple spots in the presentation where I'll be like, O'Connor says this, newspaper says that, I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, he was a human after all, and he was a man of his time. But who was Thomas O'Connor? Um, he was actually born in New Orleans. His dad was an Irish immigrant who married a woman from Philadelphia and then moved down here to start their family. He joined um, what was called Hose Company 19. It was a little volunteer unit kind of attached to the department that followed the firemen around to fires. Um, he left school at the age of 13 to study carpentry. He became a pattern maker and a machinist and then began blacksmithing um, as an apprentice. And then by 1861, he was employed at Leeds Foundry. So he was used to making things and creating things and working with his hands. He began on that little fire department auxiliary unit at age 15. Um, and then he actually became a full-fledged member of company uh, Columbia number five in 1858, and then he worked his way up the ranks, and within just 11 years time, so elected in 1868, commissioned in 1869, he was voted by his peers as the chief engineer of the fire department, and he just got reelected and reelected for every year until finally they're like, okay, let's make this a five-year appointment, and he just held on to the office. In 1882, O'Connor established a carriage and fire apparatus building business, which he turned over to his sons in 1885 to devote all of his time to the fire department. In 1891, when the department went from volunteer to professional, the city council and the mayor, and it was all agreed that he should remain at the helm of the fire department. And he held that position until his death in May of 1911. 
as a chief, and I think this is wonderful, it says he would never, ever send a man where he himself would not go. His life was endangered a number of times, kind of on the brink of death from injury in a fire. Um, so he wasn't just kind of standing in the background barking orders. He knew the city really well, and he always knew what challenges would be met by new technology. Like our streets and our soil then, perhaps as now, could not support some of the heavier equipment that the fire department wanted to use. Um, there was also always a chronic lack of a good water supply. And in his tenure, O'Connor did create an improved system of street wells to connect with the water mains to aid firefighting. Um, he was always really well informed about changes in technology, and he wanted to keep the department equipped with the latest, best, most useful devices, while also keeping sight of what was practical. He also made it a point to travel to other departments to see how they were working, what was working, what wasn't for, working for them. That way he could come home and change things about the New Orleans Fire Department. Um, but O'Connor, I think like many of us, or at least like me, can be skeptical of changes and sometimes resistant to it um, until it really proves itself worth taking on. This man was not only very well respected by firemen, but he was well respected in the city and nationally on the firefighting scene. He was a prominent member of the National Association of Fire Engineers, and he served as their president of the International Association of Fire Engineers in 1883. So that's kind of the guy who wrote this book that I use as my springboard and you'll hear a lot about, and the kind of person who influenced the department as it is today. In his book, O'Connor is of the belief that measures for fire protection were not taken in New Orleans until after the Great Fire of 1788, when, in 1792, Baron de Carondelet issued ordinances pertaining to fire protection. However, in my research, I have found that fire protection actually goes back at least as far as this guy, Luis de Unzaga y Amezaga, who I'm just going to call Unzaga. Um, he was the Spanish governor of Louisiana from 177. I'm sorry, he was not the governor that long. <laughs> he became the governor in uh, 1769, and he remained in office until 1777. So he gets an office, and around 1771, he noted that there was a lack of volunteer citizens and a lack of equipment who were willing to fight fires that broke out in the city, specifically when he witnessed a fire on Conti Street in April of 1771. So what he did was he created an ordinance that said at the first sound of the bells which ring from the principal guardhouse, all carpenters and joiners of this town no matter your color, no matter your race, no matter you're free or enslaved, should hurry to the fire with axes, hooks, pickaxes, and clubs to tear down the building that was on fire before it could spread. The penalty for not joining in this firefighting effort was prison and a fine. He also required that all citizens had ladders, buckets, axes, pickaxes, and their own gaffs at the ready or be fined for not having these things. He also made it that chimneys must be kept in safe uh, condition, that you could not light fires in the center of your house or your cabin, and all chimneys must immediately be built in homes without them. So please don't have a bonfire in the middle of your wooden house, put it in a chimney. Um, there's also evidence that during his tenure, there was a paid position called the keeper of the fire pumps within the early Cabildo government. I'm going to mention pumps and fire pumps and all these things a lot. So just this slide shows examples of what these look like. Um, basically, it was a box that held water and you would use levers on it to pump kind of in a seesaw action with men on either side and spray the water directly onto the fire. They didn't have long hoses or anything, it kind of just was A to B real quick. The wheels on them were initially um, in a fixed position. So you couldn't really steer them, but you kind of had to go a few feet and then pick it up and pivot it and put it down and go a little bit more. Um, but they were only three feet wide, so you could very easily fit them through a doorway into a building or into an alleyway. And they were pulled by people 
not horses. So the volunteer firemen would pull the engines themselves and then take buckets and fill the engine with water to spray on the fire. The horses at the time, they would be used to pull engines and wagons and parades, and this is for quite some time, but they were rented as they were needed instead of having them on hand. Um, the first engine company, Engine One, would pay $2 to the first person to show up to the station with a horse. And then once other companies came about, the first company to make it to the fire would get an extra dollar. So it's a race. You want to be the first one on the scene. The first company to have a dedicated horse pull its engine was Philadelphia number 14. And that wasn't until 1838. And that horse's name was Billy Penn. Um, so starting with Unzaga, we've got just about every governor of Louisiana, Galvez, Miro, Carondelet, Galloso, all the way through to the Louisiana Purchase, doing something about fire protection in New Orleans. Galvez purchased pumps for the city. He had ladders built for every alleyway and he commissioned axes and hooks. Galvez also designed, uh, sorry, designated the Capitol House as a central holding location for equipment and actually hired someone to have kind of on staff to keep the equipment maintained. Um, a quick note about this map. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see where the fire is. The dark squares where it's kind of the X hash marks, that, those are the parts of the city that were developed at this point. And then the rest of what is now the French Quarter wasn't developed, so the lighter areas. Um, Governor Miro was in office from 1782 until 1792. During this time, the first great fire broke out in New Orleans on Good Friday, March 21st, 1788 at 1.30 p.m. So this fire started in military treasurer Don v Vicente Jose Nunez's house on charters. And it was just a day kind of like today, but in the spring where it's gorgeous outside, but it's like really windy and it's Good Friday. So this man has a candle lit in his window. Well, the curtains blow in and the fire catches on the curtains and it just, it spreads. The, the wind just blows it onto all of these other buildings. It wound up destroying 856 of the 1100 structures in the city or four fifths of the populated section including St. Louis Cathedral and the Cabildo. Um, but during Carondelet's administration, the government purchased more fire equipment. Um, plus they got citizens to pool their money to purchase pumps for each ward. So we're starting to take measures to protect ourselves from these disasters. In February of 1793, Don Espiritu Leotau was put in charge of the fire engines as a paid job, and he was actually commissioned to build a house for the pumps with a door for each machine um, out of lumber and on the site of the former Cabildo, which is where the Cabildo is today. So if you're looking at St. Louis Cathedral, it's the building on the left. Um, he finished this brand new firehouse, as it were, in November of 1793. So we kind of have a firehouse. We've got a government that is very aware of how susceptible the city is to fire. And even though the government can't afford to hire a group of guys to keep on hand as firemen, they've really regularly ensured that firefighting equipment is available for sitting citizens to use and that they've hired someone to maintain it. And like I said, we've got that firehouse now. Unfortunately, in December of 1784, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a group of boys were playing in the courtyard of Francois Mayron's house on Royal Street, and they lit a fire that ignited hay stored nearby, and it wound up destroying 212 buildings, including a great deal of the new construction, including, including the firehouse that they had just built where the kid builder was. Um, Governor Carondelet reacted to this disaster by advocating for a tax on chimneys to, uh, to financially support fire protection measures, as well as the government paying for additional fire buckets, pumps, axes. He also hired two policemen 
to inspect, um, keep watch for arsonists and brick layers to inspect chimneys to make sure everything was up to code. He also advocated for replacing wooden shingles on roofs with tiles to just kind of nip the fire in the bud. Carondelet even had a hand pump stored in his own house and his own courtyard um, shortly and shortly after members of the Cabildo had engines stored at their houses and well. So all through these late 1700s, we've got more administrations coming in and buying more equipment. Um, we've got people making buckets and batches of 300 at a time for people to have in their homes. And then um, we keep hiring people to maintain this equipment. This tradition of maintaining apparatus and upkeep and paying someone for it continues through to the next gover governor, Salcedo. However, we still don't have a core group of people designated to fight fires. We've got the equipment, we kind of have a plan, we just don't have that thing that's really gonna make it happen. So it's still kind of a all hands on deck and just relying on people doing the right thing when the time arises. But then 1803, kind of the whole game starts to change. France was recently regained, uh, has recently regained control of Louisiana, and Napoleon sends this man named Pierre Lassat to New Orleans to act as colonial prefect. Lassat arrives in New Orleans in March 1803, not realizing that Napoleon has already sold the colony. But he goes ahead and he creates a fire brigade as part of the militia. And then with the Louisiana Purchase, we start to see more infrastructure in New Orleans. So we start getting libraries and canals and all of these things that really make it a little bit more than kind of this little city hanging on to survive. Well, in April of 1804, city council received a report from a committee, presumably made of those who were already in service of the fire engines, saying that each engine in each ward should be staffed by 15 men and commanded by a foreman. However, the fire committee that supervised the engines and allocated the equipment didn't have good communication. So all of the companies were acting independently of each other instead of working together and kind of it disintegrated and they were all fighting with each other within four months. Well, they decided to enact a bucket ordinance in 1807. Basically, everyone has to have designated buckets in their house. And then as the men run by, they grab your buckets, they scoop up water, and they dump it on the fire. So that's where we are. Um, as far as the water supply for firefighting goes, water was scooped up from the river, uh, which is generally the best bet. And then eventually firemen would pump water from cisterns or even reuse water from the gutter that they had already sprayed onto a fire to spray it back onto the fire. Um, they were primitive methods that sometimes lasted into the late 1800s and early 1900s because you got to do what you got to do. This map right here, it is an 1811 plan by Benjamin Latrobe. Um, he developed a plan for a system of waterworks in New Orleans. This plan has cast iron fire plugs with screw fittings for hoses, which are, I presume, indicated on this map by black dots around the perimeter of the city. And then it goes up through the center horizontally. And then you can kind of see where it creates a loose grid uh, over the street. So you're not hitting every corner of every street, but you're casting a wide net. Um, unfortunately, before they could complete their plan and see it to fruition, both Benjamin Latrobe and his assistant, who was his son, Henry, died of yellow fever in 1820 and 1817, respectively. Um, the plan was never really completed. Um, and it, even when it someone came in and finished kind of what it was, it never really worked. So this water supply just continued to be a problem. It was a problem for years. There's um, a report from 1869 that says that not only is the department in a whole struggling with poor equipment post-Civil War, but in terms of water supply, most of the fire plugs didn't work well if they worked at all, and all of the pipes in the city needed replacing. And this is when the predecessor to today's sewage and water board took over. 
1876, only half of the hydrants were operational. Pumps supplying the water were only working at half capacity. And in most parts of town, especially the poor ones, there just wasn't any water supply at all, no hydrants, nothing. This water supply was really a problem for Thomas O'Connor. He was always fighting against it. You look at newspaper articles and he's just bringing it up constantly that they don't have what they need in terms of water to do the job. Um, unfortunately, there were a few times where he was proven right. There was a fire. It was either 1905 or 1908. It was on the river fire broke out and the nearest fire hydrants were three blocks away. So you had to run hoses three blocks and just, it was a whole mess. Continued to be a mess, plagued O'Connor. Um, sorry, this is a map from 1815. So in the early 1800s, there's a little bit more of a fire protection system in place. Each ward has its pump and a designated crew to man it while all other able-bodied men are still expected to show up and help. There's also a 30-man crew of sapours that are there to wield axes. This is a core group of men who are tradesmen accustomed to using the tool or tools like them. So these are blacksmiths, they're carpenters, they're wheelwrights, and they're iron workers who have the um, technical skills and the musculature to chop stuff down. Um, the system for signaling a fire at this time was for someone to ring the church bells. And then someone in the steeple of St. Louis Cathedral, which is in the top center of this map, I know it looks different, um, would then either wave a flag in daylight or a torch by night to signal what direction the fire was in. And then everyone would head that direction and just kind of find it. Um, there was a call to create paid fire companies in July of 1817, but it failed. However, in 1821, New Orleans took a solid step into the volunteer phase of firefighting. So it's expected civil obligation, volunteer professional, right? So 1821, this group of merchants comes together, tired of the lack of service that they have, and they create the Washington Fire Society. It is a step closer, much, much closer to the formation of the Volunteer Fire Department, which in its earliest days consisted of groups of men, often professionals such as merchants or lawyers or businessmen with some disposable income, who would come together pool their resources and create companies that not only had a chain of command to them, but that owned their own fire equipment. The officers of this Washington Fire Society in 1822 were President Ebenezer Fisk, who was a merchant, Vice President William, William Fitz Jr., who was a merchant, and then Secretary was George Kuhn, who was also a merchant. So people with property to protect and the income to put toward that protection. It's in the spring of 1829 that the cornerstone for today's department was well and truly laid. The first volunteer fire company, initially known as Cotton Press Number no. 1, held their first regular meeting in April of 1829 at the New Orleans Cotton Press. In May of that year, they transferred into their own designated fire station on Hunter Street, which was still near the cotton press um, and is now the parking lot for Mardi Gras World and the Convention Center. In 1834, they renamed the company Volunteer Number no. One. One of the founders of Number no. One was a man named Harry Buckman, who was a lumber trader who lived near the Hunter Street. Hunter's Steam Mill, who bought and maintained the engine of number one at his own expense. Mr. Buckman was the last surviving original member of this company and at one point on the board of the New Orleans Cotton Press. He was known at the time as the father of the New Orleans Fire Department. As companies formed after volunteer number one, they generally had this core group of experienced members who were coming from engine one into another company to function as its founding members and lead the way. 
Um, another company, Mississippi Number no. 2, was organized January 22nd, 1830, and grew out of this crazy collaboration um, at an 1829 fire between men from Volunteer Number no. 1 and a group of men at Leeds Foundry who happened to be firemen from New York. So they get together and they fight this fire using the training of the New York firemen, because our firemen didn't have any training at the time. Um, and they used an engine borrowed from Leeds Foundry to fight a cotton press fire. Um, it's important to note here that, like I said, now and many decades later, firefighting was learned on the job by individuals as they joined companies and not through any kind of training school. So you learn as you go, you might have drills, but it's usually, let's, you're thrown into the fire, so to speak, to learn. Um, four more companies were founded after this in 1833 and 1834. These are Lafayette number three, Washington number four, Columbia number five, and Mechanics number six. So these six existing companies made an appearance in the memorial parade New Orleans had for the Marquis de Lafayette in 1834. Um, an important note here, really important note here, all of these companies were private entities that generally owned or leased their own house, their own equipment, bought their own uniforms, everything is theirs. Over time, they entered into contracts with the city uh, for fire protection, and they received some equipment, some allowance for equipment from the city government, but the companies at this time were very, very much um, fraternal organizations that performed a civic duty of firefighting. So these companies, they not only fought these fires together, but they held fancy dress balls to raise money for their companies. They hosted housewarming parties when a new station was open. They participated in competitions with other companies. Um, they had annual picnics and they would even come together to mourn the loss of their fellow company members. Horses were sometimes named for men in the community. Um, engines were often named for women. And then children in the community or of the firemen would serve as the mascots of the company. Members were active firemen for six years and then they became exempt or retired, but they were still very much a part of the social aspects of the company. It's also worth noting that firemen at the time were exempt from both military service and jury duty. Um, so as we're moving along, I just wanted to say that the form and function of a firehouse also changed a lot as the personnel of the fire department changed. This particular slide, as you'll see, it's the evolution of one particular company on one little piece of land. So in the early days of communal obligations, firehouses were generally no more than like a storage shed with maybe a bench to sit on after the fire when you got back, um, a garage even. But as the volunteer companies formed these kind of fraternal organizations, firehouses not only kept space for equipment, but they would also have areas dedicated to socialization and parties, usually a second floor on the station, uh, like a, a hall for events above the apparatus floor. These companies would even furnish these spaces and make them as plush and comfortable as they liked. Um, some newspaper articles of the time talk about their lace curtains and their crystal chandeliers and their plush chairs. Um, over time, they went from keeping the horses and stuff in the apparatus floor to kind of moving them out to their own stalls. And then as firemen, the expectations of being a fireman and being at the station and platoons and all of these things, they added dormitories and whatnot to stations. So this slide is just a look at how Engine 9 has changed. It was actually originally on the basically the back side of the other side of the block you can see here. So it was over on Elysian Fields. Um, and this spot, it's on Esplanade and Frenchman, if you're familiar with the area across from the US Mint. Um, I'm gonna drink a sip of water. Okay, sorry. 18th century fire companies often adopted names that were either patriotic, water themed, 
or represented a virtue that the fire companies wanted to be associated with. Um, the first five companies tick all of these boxes. Volunteer, Mississippi, you got the river, um, Washington. George Washington was actually a volunteer fireman. Anyway, um, early volunteer firemen were generally people with, like I said, property or goods that needed protecting, or they were a group of like-minded people, be it professionally or their lineage. So depending on the group, sometimes the group would charge really high dues to keep less wealthy citizens out of that company or kind of limit the company's membership by some other means. For example, Mechanics Number no. 6 was founded by a group of Leeds Foundry employees, and you had to be a member of Leeds Foundry to be part of that company. And their station was at the corner of St. Joseph and Commerce, which is right around the corner from Leeds Foundry. Philadelphia Number no. 14 was founded by a group of men from Philadelphia. And the original Louisiana number 10 was in present day Armstrong Park, and it was founded by a group of Spanish Creole heritage citizens. Um, that company, though, was purchased by a group of Germans in 1843, which is kind of toward the end of a two plus decade of two plus decade wave of German immigration to the city. In 1846, Vigilant number three in this slide was founded at the intersection of Galvez and Bayou Road, right by Esplanade, by a group of Germans, um, which were a group of members that, um, sorry, German immigrants had a history at the time of really being into fraternal organizations and like-minded organizations with other Germans, German-speaking churches, Turner's Club very much supporting themselves and other immigrants in the community. Um, it was brought up before the first incarnation of this presentation was done at the Deutsches House. And I really tried to integrate the role of Germans in the volunteer days of the department in that presentation. While I was researching it, I was getting a little frustrated frustrated because I was finding bits and bobs of evidence of Germans in the fire department in newspaper articles, um, but I wasn't really finding anything that was, I felt enough for me to go on or inspiring to keep going, and I got a little bogged down, so I put it, put it away for a minute, and I started looking at genealogy, my genealogy, and along the way, I found the obituary of my third great-grandmother, Anna Maria Mary Baltzer Lynx, who was a German immigrant. Um, she came over with her dad and her siblings after the mom died in Germany and just started a new life in New Orleans. But I was really surprised because when I was looking at her obituary, it said that the people who were invited to the funeral services were officers and members of the Firemen's Charitable Association, and that her burial was to take place in the Fireman's Cemetery, which was so bizarre to me because it's 1913 and she's a woman. Like she's she's not on the fire department. So I started digging a little bit more. And um, long story short, her brother, Peter Ludwig or Louis Baltzer, was a founding member of Vigilant Number no. 3 over on Galvez and Bayou Road. And both of Peter's sons were on the fire department. Um, so here, this little orange arrow is just pointing to Lewis, sorry, Lewis Baltzer um, in the roll book for Vigilant Number 3. So I dug a little bit more, probably would have been less digging in the long run, but long way around. My three times great grandmother was married to a fireman who was also a German immigrant and a member of Vigilant Number 3. Um, so my third great grandfather, John Lynx. So I assume they either met, you know, through Mary's brother, or they happened to go to the same church, and then John became a fireman because of the I it's funny. It's I had no idea anyone in my family had ever been on the fire department except for a couple cousins. 
other than my dad. And then all of a sudden they're the founding members of one of these German companies. And then that just kind of made me so much more excited to research the German um, part of the fire department in the volunteer days. Um, so this is John. He uh, is his son, Jacob, my great great grandfather, was also a fireman at Vigilant Number Three. So here I am with this personal connection to the department. Um, but it, it gets better. Um, they were founding members at this house, in this space, in this firehouse that was also the first house my dad was ever at when he was in the fire department and it's where he was when I was a baby. So just all of these things to get, came together um, and it was really neat. But in researching all these family members, um, it really, it led me to all of these old department role books on this database called Family Search that the New Orleans Public Library has access to. You just have to go to the library to use their computers or use your computer on their Wi-Fi at the library to get to these databases. Um, but it was so neat to then go into these books and look at all of these companies and see other companies that had a large German membership. So all of a sudden Crescent 24 in the Bywater uh, was largely German, et cetera. So that wound up being just quite the rabbit hole to fall down. Um, very neat. Never know what you're going to find when looking through your own genealogy, even as a distraction. Back to the fire department. Um, okay. Something went down in 1833 that I am not entirely clear on. And it's one of those instances where I feel like O'Connor's account is a bit dubious. And I don't have great newspaper sources for it to go back to. So my account is very brief, but I feel like it's important. Um, it seems like for some reason in November of 1833, the city council took the existing companies number three and four and placed them and their equipment under the control of an African-American man named Johnson and manned those companies with African-American men who seem to have been hired instead of volunteers. I don't really know how or why that unfolded. So now you have engines one and two who started the department um, and they find this appropriation of reputation and resources unfair. So they come together and they decide they're gonna kind of unionize and create a unified volunteer fire department. One of the first orders of business was to threaten to withdraw their fire protection services if the city council didn't take the equipment from three and four and then give it back to the original companies. And then they, as the fire department, went as far as to parade their equipment to Jackson Square during a public event and to deliver this threat before an audience literally up on a stage. Well, the city gave in and they returned the equipment from three and four back to the original companies with the the caveat that one and two make sure the guys from three and four are behaving. Like I said, I don't know what happened. I would love to know to be researched. Um, this, however, is kind of a whole precursor to a continued resistance of firemen to become, among other things, a paid force instead of a volunteer. They felt that firefighting was a very noble thing that you shouldn't be paid for and you shouldn't want to be paid for. And if it's a paid job, it's going to attract the wrong kind of person. Um, so that kind of set the tone there. The existing six companies that made their appearance for the Memorial Parade for Lafayette in 1834. And then later that year, they started a group called the Fireman's Charitable Association or FCA, or the association, which was organized by delegates of the six existing companies on November 17th, 1834, and officially incorporated on March 4th, 1835. 
This action of uniting the existing volunteer force in the city of New Orleans under the umbrella of one organization that oversaw operations that held a contract for fire protection in the city and established a benevolent society for the purpose of providing a system of relief for needy members and families of deceased members. So no matter how dubious these other actions might have been in 1833, it really kicked off this union of the companies, a good system of organization, and a benevolent society that took care of women and children and retired members and injured members. In the first year alone, the city paid the Firemen's Charitable Association $1,000 for fire protection. The general fund for the association received $1 from every individual member of a fire company, and then each company gave $20 toward taking care of widows and orphans. Um, the association kept records of all of their members and then their dependents over the years. So this is what I found on Family Search. It's an example of a Fireman's Charitable Association record of members, widows and children from the early 1900s that I found while digging through things. Uh, the orange arrows indicate my family members. So we have my three times great grandfather, John, and then his son, Jacob, and then Jacob's children, including my great grandmother, Louisa, in the list of Jacob's children. So as you can see, it shows what company the men were with. So it's the name, the company they were with. So we're seeing 186, Vigilant number three, Millenberg number one. Um, and then where the men lived. So if you're looking at genealogy and you're looking for data, I always love using addresses to make sure I have the right person with the right name to just kind of cover my bases. <clears throat> so while the original firemen were, like I said earlier, from the more elite citizenry, so lawyers, merchants, people with disposable income, over time, these elite guys kind of aged out and then as the city grew and the job got harder, more working class men joined. But to quote Thomas O'Connor, this of course diminished to a degree the value of the social element of the development as it had existed in the old times. But the new element was perhaps even better adapted to such continuous duty as the new conditions of the service required. Um, just a few examples of the elite are Lewis Alfred Wiltz, who was president of Creole No. 9, vice president of the Firemen's Charitable Association, mayor of New Orleans, lieutenant governor of Louisiana, a member of the Louisiana House of Representatives, and governor of Louisiana, which is very impressive, not only as a human, but especially considering he died at age 38. Um, if you live in New Orleans, you've probably heard of Jacob Shane and Son Funeral Home on Canal Street, right? Big building, all the obituaries, which you might be surprised to learn is that Jacob Shane was actually a volunteer fireman. He was a member of Crescent Number 24 in the Bywater, which was an area of town once known as Little Saxony because of its robust German population. Um, so Shane... Jacob Shane was a German immigrant who went from a longshoreman to the owner of a livery business. And then during a yellow fever epidemic, he got into the funeral business because he always already had all of these wagons and stuff to transport, frankly, bodies. Um, some of his descendants, even today, are still involved with the Firemen's Charitable Association. And then this is Jacob Shane's name just right there among everyone else's in a roll book for Crescent number 24. So I had mentioned we'll talk about the evolution of technology and kind of who's in the department and cultural aspects. Well, one of the cultural aspects was this huge annual March 4th Fireman's Day Parade. It was an annual celebration of the founding of the Firemen's Charitable Association. The annual festivities began around 1837 or 1838 and eventually grew into a day with a large church service in the morning, followed by an absolutely massive parade 
and then evenings full of banquets and fancy dress balls. If this sounds familiar, it's kind of how Mardi Gras parades happen today. And this parade definitely predates Comus's first float parade in New Orleans in 1857. Um, this was such a big deal in the city that businesses would decorate all along the parade route. Citizens would hang banners from their balconies. Women would get flowers to hand to the firemen on the route. Um, <laughs> companies from surrounding areas would come to join in. So guys from Biloxi and Mobile and Montgomery would bring their engines and everything. And um, it was just really this wonderful opportunity for the firemen to put on a spectacle for the city and then for the citizens to show their appreciation for the fire by cheering them on. Um, they would sing songs that were written for them and then like the newspaper would publish the lyrics so everyone would have the lyrics to sing on the day. Um, and they would, like I said, give them flowers. But this of course had a spirit of rivalry to it and spurred companies to outshine each other every year. One of my favorite little tidbits is that in 1844, this fireman named Wilhelmus Bogart of Philadelphia number 14 actually rented a circus elephant and rode it in the parade. Um, in 1851, Fireman's Day happened to fall on Mardi Gras Day, but since Mardi Gras parades weren't really a thing yet, the firemen were able to parade that day. The parade festivities were, of course, suspended during the Civil War. Um, and there were times when maybe the firemen's festivities overlapped with Lundy Gras and you didn't want to mess with all the Rex guys stuff, so the firemen would delay a day. But um, not only did they publish lyrics ahead of time to songs, but they also, like today, published the route. And if you look at this route from 1886, this route goes all the, it starts on like Cali Open Camp, and then it goes all the way to First Street, cuts down toward the river, and then makes its way all the way into the Marini before coming back and ending. Like this is a monstrous parade route. And then just to give you an idea of the enormity of the number of men involved, in 1887, the department had 1,000 active firemen and 2,000 exempt firemen in the city, while the city had a population of about 242,000. So that's potentially 3,000 people participating in the marching of the parade itself. In comparison, as of 2022, New Orleans has about 570 firemen and um, over th who work over three platoons and the population of the city is 384,500. Um, Fireman's Day even became a state holiday, which meant government, everything just stopped all over the state, everywhere in Louisiana, not just New Orleans. And if you were in Shreveport and didn't get to play, so sad. Um, in the parade, each company would wear their dress uniforms and the companies bore a special set. The horses wore special satin harnesses and saddles for the occasion and the horses name and achievements were published in the accounts of the day. Everything was polished and decorated and painted. Um, and as for the decor on the engines, they would use flowers and satin pillows and ribbons and um, paper mache figures, and they would do birds and alligators and pyramids and human figures. Um, it was also a time for companies to memorialize members and horses. The firemen, as well as their wives, daughters, and members of the community would help decorate, and some even hired professionals. So this is just an 1886 parade bulletin to give you an idea of how the engines would decorate. So we're looking at here and take maybe pay, pay special attention to box number 12. So this looks like a plane engine. They would have been on duty that day. So they were ready to duck out of the parade and go to a fire at any time. And then a lady um, named Patricia Schreiber gave me this photo of and her great, great grandfather, George was a member of Lafayette number two. Um, but she gave me a photo of this engine. So this engine here is what it would have looked like in person whereas box 12 is what it looked like in the bulletin. Um, 
Come on, buddy. There we go. Um, it was a spectacle that rivaled even Mardi Gras, and the parade unfortunately stopped when the department became a paid department in 1892. They tried to revive it a couple times over the years, specifically on Mardi Gras Day 1930. They had a little mini parade um, that kind of went from Central Station to Louisiana and back. And these are photos from that parade. So you see the volunteers lined up on either side, and usually the horses would be in the middle. And that's one of the decorated engines. But the revivals never really stuck. And um, Unfortunately, it's one of those things that's kind of just lost to time. Another big event that the firemen would put on was the Firemen's Festival. And this started in the late 1860s and lasted until the 1940s, surprisingly, with the last few years of it taking place at Pontchartrain Beach. So it would be held every year in the late spring or early summer at the fairgrounds race course. It would last three to five days. And it was just a festival full of music, dancing, games, flying horses to ride, sports, all kinds of racing, baseball games, ladder climbing competitions, boxing matches, and then fireworks in the evening. Citizens would donate prizes, people would buy tickets, and it, the purpose of it was to raise money for the Benevolent Association. Um, companies would also have their own smaller picnics, but this was the main one. A big milestone for the young fire department came just three years after the founding of the fire department and the Fireman's Charitable Association, and that was the very unfortunate and untimely death of Irid Ferry. I might be saying his name wrong. I've only read it. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. Um, on New Year's Day, 1837, a 36-year-old merchant named Irid Ferry was the foreman of Mississippi Number no. 2, and he was injured while saving a child at a fire on Camp Street. Three days later, he died of his injuries, and upon his death, Arid Ferry was dubbed the first martyr of the fire department. His tragic death, and possibly because he really didn't seem to have any family at all in the city, uh, motivated the Firemen's Charitable Association to procure a, a cemetery dedicated to the burial and remembrance of the city's firemen. Um, Ferry was seen as more than just a Louisiana fireman. He represented the heroism and sacrifice of firemen everywhere. So the association originally reserved a space at the center of the Protestant cemetery in the city, later known as the Gerard Street Cemetery, which is basically sort of now a parking lot between the Superdome and the main post office. Um, they plan to put a monument to Ferry as its centerpiece, um, but before they could build the monument, a wealthy New Orleanian named Stephen Henderson passed away in 1838, leaving land and $10,000 to the Firemen's Charitable Association. The association then sold and leased portions of this land, and they were able to purchase the property for Cypress Grove Cemetery, um, also known as Fireman Cemetery, on the outskirts of the city at the intersection of what is now Canal Street and City Park Avenue. So this is a little etching of that cemetery in the time. This is an 1889 photo. Um, on April 25th, 1841, there was a large ceremony and then funeral pro procession as they moved the remains of 13 firemen and ferry to the new Cypress Grove Cemetery. Um, a thousand people gathered outside the church to watch the proceedings and pay their tribute. And this is the same day that Ferry, of course, went to his final resting place under a monument built in his memory. Um, when Cypress Grove was built in 1841, cemeteries at the time also served as kind of public parks where people could take a stroll or have a picnic and just spend time in the shade of the trees. Uh, so Cypress Grove was originally one of these really beautiful kind of bucolic park-like spaces with an actual grove of cypress trees for shade. Um, but since it was also out on the edge of town, it was nice and quiet. Unfortunately, not too long after it opened, there was a flood that killed a lot of their trees. Um, and then just kind of over the years, storms and flooding killed more trees. And now it's just wedged in this really busy intersection and basically the interstate. So this is what it looked like in 1889. 
Um, and then this is what the front gates look like today. As you can see, there are very few trees. To be fair, I took these photos in the winter, so there were no leaves on the trees, but still no trees. This is the monument to Arid Ferry. It's near the front of the cemetery. Um, the column is broken off, off to represent a life cut short. And then there's a relief of Mississippi number no. two's hand pump on the side. The remains of the 13 other firemen moved that day are in a nearby tomb, which looked like this in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then this is what it looks like today. Um, this cemetery was originally reserved for firemen and then their families. And then the association started selling vaults and plots to the public to raise money. It was also a popular place for Protestants in the city to go. Um, there's quite a number of Germans there. And it was also popular with Americans from the Northeast who preferred in-ground burials instead of the above-ground tombs. Um, the association opened a second cemetery in 1852 called Greenwood. This cemetery was and still is far less park-like. It has fewer trees so they could have more graves, which made the plots less expensive to purchase and there were more plots to sell. Just some price comparisons. In 1856, lots in Cypress Grove ranged from $16 to $300 and upper tier vaults were $68 where in Greenwood, you could get a lot for between $10 and $30, and then the upper tier of vaults were $40. Um, as you can tell, the cemeteries became a way for the association to raise funds for distribution. Um, and the association still runs these two cemeteries today. At the front of uh, Greenwood Cemetery is the Fireman's Monument. This was erected in memory of the firemen who lost their lives in service. It was designed by Charles Orleans. Um, the six foot tall fireman was sculpted by Alexander Doyle and it was carved out of marble by a distinguished artist of Rome named Nicoli. The pagoda itself is granite and the pedestal and arches are white main granite. Um, it cost $14,000 to build and was dedicated in October, 1887 in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. That day, each company of the department, all fully decked out, made their way to Greenwood from each of their own firehouses. Um, the companies at the time or are on the base, kind of around the firemen. And um, you may or may not remember that the fireman was decapitated by a vandal in 1991. He lost his head, he lost part of his arm, as well as his hose, which is actually still missing. The head and arm were recovered on the West Bank and replaced in November of 92 by a man named Vincent Imbruglio. Um, the monument was then shored, leveled, and raised in 2011. For a number of years, perhaps until the 70s or 80s, every March 4th, the Fireman's Charitable Association will lay a wreath at the base of the monument. Greenwood is also where Chief Thomas O'Connor is buried with his family. Um, so in the midst of the Firemen's Charitable Association opening the cemeteries of the city, the first hand engine was built in New Orleans. This photo isn't it, it's just the one in the museum. Um, in 1849, Phoenix number no. eight ordered a hand engine from machinist A.C. Jones on Gerard Street. It was the first ever built in New Orleans, was designed to suit the city, um, specifically meaning that the levers were made so they could fold up so the engine could fit through alleyways and into courtyards for firefighting. The engine made its debut in the March 4th parade of that year. 1855 um, saw really two big kind of wobbles or missteps for the department and the people they had to work with. The first one was Young America. Young America was the first steam powered engine used for firefighting in New Orleans as well as one of the earliest in the nation. This new cutting edge equipment was purchased and put into service by the insurance underwriters who didn't necessarily have a lot of experience firefighting, but were definitely interested in putting fires out and saving money, long and short of it. Um, the firemen didn't like Young America. It weighed 
over 18,000 pounds, which was horrible for New Orleans streets and our alluvial soil. Um, it was also too heavy to pull out onto wharves, which we had a lot of at the time. Um, and it required special hydrants be installed. 16. So this thing had its 16 of its own fire hydrants. Because of all these faults, it was basically useless and they had to abandon it the same year that it was put into service. Um, the insurance underwriters commissioned another steamer that was designed and built in New Orleans. It was half the weight of Young America and that one worked out much better for the city. Um, volunteer number one got the next steamer in 1860 and then they kind of started to follow after that. By 1873, all the companies in the city had steam fire engines, except for the one out in Millenburg. They held out until 1899. The other big thing was the Firemen's Revolt of 1855. So kind of up until this point of time, not kind of, definitely, all of the firemen are volunteers. It's seen as noble. They don't want to be paid. And the fire department was overwhelmingly funded by financial contributions from the public. So the city paid the association a small sum for fire protection. They owned some of the apparatus, some of the property, but overwhelmingly the department's its own thing. Um, shortly after the Young America debacle, the New Orleans City Council made it known that they wanted to take control of the fire department, make it a municipal em entity, and make it a paid department. Um, one of the first big moves for this was in May of 1855, when they named a man, J.H. Wingfield, as the chief engineer. So they just picked their own chief instead of having somebody elected, um, which was really a slap in the face to the department. They also put seven companies out of service without letting the association know. Well, in October of 1855, the firemen came back to the council, basically saying that they wanted to remain a volunteer force, but be better funded or they'll quit. Well, the city council and the insurance companies called the firemen's bluff. The delegates met in November and they decided that they would just hand over all of the city owned equipment and sever all connections with the local government. So this is so dramatic. I love it. <laughs> on December 1st, 1855, all of the companies who had apparatus belonging to the city held a procession from Canal Street uh, down camp to Lafayette Square, which was in front of City Hall, and they were ringing the bell and treating it like a funeral, and they surrendered all of their equipment. Well, if you remember, I said that a lot of these companies would have their own decor and whatnot in the houses. One of those things was the big man. Much like the Irid Fairy statue that was in one of the earlier slides, the big man was a wooden figurehead. These were popular in the early 18, in the 1800s. Um, the big man was one of these like a chandelier, like a chair, one of these pieces of private property that the firemen put on perhaps what was a city owned house. Um, the big man came about in 1837 when Columbia number no. five ordered him from New York to adorn the copper cupola of their Gerard Street firehouse. And the big man sat up there for 15 years um, with his arm extended and a fire trumpet to his lips until the revolt. Um, so to make a statement about their own ownership of the department and its property, on the same day that the firemen made a big show of surrendering equipment in Lafayette mm -hmm. Square, the city went over to Dorod Street and they took the big, big man down from his perch, boxed him up, and put him in storage. I don't know what happened to the big man. I haven't found anything else. Um, this photo in this slide was taken 12 years after he was removed. The firehouse on the right still stands. Obviously, he was not put back. Um, the next day, on December 2nd, Chief Wingfield began organizing a new department, and the city began hiring paid firemen. Um, but the new firemen, where they were inexperienced, they weren't trained, they didn't know what they were doing. So the city kind of 
stepped back and they put out bids for a new contract. And long story short, the association bought back the volunteer company's equipment from the city. They won the contract for providing the city with fire protection. And in just a few weeks, the volunteer fire department was back to business as usual. So, so far we've seen some technological advancements that took firefighting in the city from buckets to hand pumps to steam engines. Um, but another newfangled doodad that hit the department came in the late 1800s. So the old system was ringing church bells and pointing in the direction, right? In the early 1850s, American cities started using fire alarm telegraphs. Um, they were put in service in northern cities, and then New Orleans kind of adopted, kind of did adopt it June 14th, 1859. It was a system consisting of street fire alarm boxes that communicated with a central control station in City Hall, Gallier Hall. So someone would ring the alarm on the box. The signal would go to the main thing. Numbers would come out on a ticker tape to say what box it was, and then the station operator would let the right companies know. You can see one of these boxes on the side of the firehouse on the left. Um, anyway, the volunteers didn't like this new system. They were pushing back against the technology and they had an idea. To prove that the new system is was bad, as soon as they were going to hear it for the first time, they were going to run out to their local church and just ring the bells as loudly as they could and drown it out and prove that it was worthless. Well, someone got wind of it and they shot them down. And um, the first fire alarm telegraph system went out, signal went out on June 15th. Um, another advancement was chemical engines. Um, these were first seen in the 1870s when Babcock extinguishers, basically fire extinguishers came out in New Orleans. They were well liked, so they were put into use. And then Babcock engines, which are basically really big fire extinguishers on wheels, were introduced. Um, the insurance guys, the insurance underwriters, jumped at the chance to have these in the city. And the companies, they bought their own engines, and the companies were formed to man the engines. These companies fell under the jurisdiction of the underwriters, and they were called the Babcock Corps. They weren't particularly welcome on the firefighting scene. And um, according to O'Connor, who is now chief engineer, this created a kind of steam engine versus chemical engine rivalry. Um, basically, the firemen felt that the chemical engines were interfering with their work. And it got to the point where like punches were thrown, newspaper reports came out, the police got involved. It was really ugly. And he finally admits, though, in his 1895 book that the introduction of chemical engines, notwithstanding the friction arising from the dictatorial inclination of the insurance men, was due largely to the discernment on the part of the chief of their great utility. Um, these chemical companies didn't participate in parades. Uh, their rented firehouses were honestly usually just city property that was little more than a garage. Usually the upgrade was the inclusion of lockers. And they were just kind of seen as lesser than in the early days. And um, O'Connor says very, very little about them in his book. Um, by 1881, when the city went to renew their contract for fire protection with the association, they used it as an opportunity to accomplish reforms without violent change. One of the changes was that the chemical engines became part of the fire department. 1891. So over the years, the Firemen's Charitable Association gave out a great deal of money to widows, orphans, and firemen in need. Unfortunately, the funds eventually became too much of a final financial commitment to be carried out. Um, and while the association had a contract for fire protection with the city, it had to be renewed every few years. And in 1891, instead of renewing the contract with a volunteer force, a paid department was created under the leadership of Thomas O'Connor. Um, the city council decided in September of 1891 that they were going to approve an, an ordinance to move this forward. 
the city purchased all of the fire equipment. They purchased all of the houses that were still owned by the companies. They kept O'Connor as the engineer. Um, and then they kind of helped him put new leadership in place. Well, with the city now shouldering the responsibility of running the operations of the department, purchasing, maintaining equipment, paying a dedicated force, providing for injured families, etc., the association now became the Firemen's Charitable and Benevolent Association, and they focused on charitable duties and the cemeteries. Um, this act also absorbed the once independent Carrollton and Algiers fire departments into the New Orleans Fire Department, and they redrew all the districts. So the paid fire department, as we know it today, was set to come into being at noon on December 15th, 1891, when the tolling of the fire alarm went off. But they had um, one more unfortunate event in the way. So 1 a.m. December 15th, it is cold and rainy and nasty and windy. And the volunteer fire department fought their last fire on South Peter Street near Natchez. And this fire was just a beast. It was huge. There were live electrical wires all over the place. Ladder trucks couldn't get their ladders up. Guys couldn't get equipment in. It was just a mess. It took them over an hour to get the fire under control. Um, that night, there was a 33-year-old fireman, pipeman Matthew Hannon, on Columbia Number no. 5, Thomas O'Connor's old company. Um, and he was there working beside his friend Thomas O'Connor. And Hannon showed up to the fire. He had his regular uniform hat on. And as he went to slip, switch from his cloth hat to his leather helmet, O'Connor took the hose from him. Um, and unfortunately, the water from the hose came into contact with a downed live power line and it shocked O'Connor and he, it almost knocked him down. So he steps back, he readjusts while Hannon follows him to grab the hose back. And unfortunately he didn't see the power line. And as he went to grab the hose from O'Connor, his outstretched arm made contact with the line. And he was electrocuted to death right there on the scene. And when he fell, he fell onto his friend, Thomas O'Connor, who was then shot through his friend Hannon's body. Um, so that was kind of the last gasp of the volunteer department. And then later that day, you know, everybody had to collect themselves. And all of the captains of each fire company stepped out into the street in front of their firehouses, you know, all dressed up and ready to go. And the bells tolled noon, and then they just all stepped back into their stations as captains of this new paid department. Um, moving into the 20th century. The first Steam-powered automobile fire engine was tried out in London in August 1898. Um, shockingly to me, not far behind London was New Orleans, who began discussing the purchase of a horseless steam-powered engine in February of 1899. O'Connor loved having modern equipment. He wanted the best for his guys, but he was also, he always knew that you needed to balance your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations with like, what is really actually going to work here? What, what is practical for us? He was concerned that the automobile would just be too large and just too heavy for New Orleans streets and just too unwieldy for his chauffeurs to operate and that it would scare the horses and endanger the public. So he basically didn't like it. And um, he also didn't like that this is great concern that it would have to raise a whole head of steam before leaving the firehouse. Um, when a reporter for the Daily Picayune saw the prototype of this engine in March of 1899, they called it the biggest and heaviest and ugliest fire machine in use today. Well, despite practical and aesthetic protests, Fire Commissioner Sullivan wanted the machine and Signs of moving forward with the purchase and the use of the vehicle appeared in April 1899. So November 1899, Engine 5, it's on Julia Street, 
it's a fairly new house, it's 13 years old, great space. Um, they love it, but the horseless engine is supposed to go to another nearby engine house, number two, over on Magazine and Lafayette. Those quarters aren't as nice. Well, the apparatus committee suggests that engine five move from their nice quarters on Julia into engine two's quarters, and that engine two move into five's quarters so it can house the new piece of equipment. Engine five, instead of taking on the equipment themselves, they agree to the trade. Um, in March of 1900, the city purchased the horseless engine and put it into service on Julia Street. Well, throughout 1901, the steam-powered automobile would break down, like it would have pump pieces shoot out of the hose nozzle, and it was just kind of generally a lemon. It actually became known as the white elephant of the fire department, which is how it was referenced in the newspaper. Um, Newspaper reports of the day claimed O'Connor, who found the engine unsuitable department, also might have thrown a few wrenches into the operation. He made sure the operators had a high turnover. He said that the engine was being asked to run too far over bad roads, um, that it never had enough steam by the time it got to where it was going. And then sometimes he would even assign men to the engine as a form of punishment. So he's kind of against it and then all of a sudden all the operators or chauffeurs knew that O'Connor didn't like it so then they would kind of let it fall into disrepair well by in 1905 they made to just the decision to just retrofit it so it could be pulled by horses so they kind of gave up um four years later they got a new auto engine in the same house March 1909 I think this engine picture here is a joke uh, because it was published on April 1st. I haven't found anything else about it, but it's a long article. Um, but this is a design for an electric fire engine designed in New Orleans, tested in Audubon Park. It was designed by Mr. E. H. McFall, who was an actual man. He worked on the electric telegraph alarm system. Um, and basically, this was powered by electric rather than steam, and it used electric to raise its ladders and everything else. And basically, you get it to the fire, and you would plug it into electricity there, and it would, I mean, be powered by electric instead of steam. Like I said, though, I don't, I don't think it existed. Um, Thomas O'Connor seen in this newspaper scan here, remained in charge of the New Orleans Fire Department until his death on May 20th, 1911, when in the early-ish stages of liver failure, he took his own life at his home at 518 Julia Street near camp. Um, the house still stands. He was such a prominent and well-respected figure in American firefighting that his obituary ran on the front page of the New York Times. After his death, the Times Democrat wrote, Chief O'Connor has always been regarded as the connecting link between the past and the present, as he was fully identified with the most glorious period of the volunteer firemen, and at the same time stands as the representative of the more modern type of firefighters. In this one individuality is seen the evolution of the volunteers into the regular army of home defenders. His success, oh goodness, his successor was Louis Pujol, um, who took over in 1911. Pujol was the chief of the department until 1919. Um, and he really pushed for a lot of evolution in the fire department at this time. He was the first one of the first men in the department to actually win an award for his actions. Um, and like I said, he was responsible for bringing a lot of new equipment into the department. And it was during his tenure that they built the central fire station on Decatur. Um, so here's the central fire station. It was designed by E.A. Christie, who did a lot of public schools in New Orleans. Um, it was built in 1914 to house an engine, a hook and ladder, a chemical company, a water tower company, uh, also to serve as the bespoke administrative hub of the department and to place and as a place to train firemen. Um, 
leading up to the 20th century, like I hinted at earlier, most firemen learned the job on the job and adapted to technology as it was introduced, meaning that rookies were kind of just thrown into things without any knowledge of what was going on, really. Um, and then companies would occasionally do drills and raising ladders and throwing water and driving, but not a set system. Um, around 1909, so a few years before O'Connor's death, the department was in the planning stages of building a drill tower and establishing a training regime, but it was Louis Pujol who the really saw it through. Um, this is the drill tower at Central Station, as well as their like gym and their groups of guys that work there and they had a pool table. Um, with the drill tower, firemen learned how to use ladders and hoses and tie knots and do rescues from a height without actually having to be on the job to learn these things. So now they're not only getting this practical training before getting to work, but they were getting better training while on the job. Over time, they eventually added academic courses in firefighting, lessons on how to drive automotive engines, and a smoke room to tra train the men in more realistic conditions. Um, this is just a picture of the drill tower at Central Station in 1939. It's not there anymore. And then the photo on the right is just a photo of the gym in Engine 11 on Napoleon and Pitt. Um, the new Central Fire Station also had a gym. This was just kind of a push um, from the late 1800s about um, civil service reforms. Firemen needed to be in shape to do the job that, that was required of them. It was also kind of a descendant of physical culture in America, which was uh, groups of people getting, to, getting together to do get fit and do gymnastics and kind of come together through movement. Um, in June of 1918, with Chief Pujol still at the helm, another major shift occurred. The city opened bids to fully motorize the fire department. Horses in the New Orleans Fire Department, and I'm sure in other places as well, were not only super well-trained, but they were, among other things, they were super well-trained, so they... They knew that when the alarm sounded that their um, the lock was going to open on their stall and they were going to go get in place and the harness was going to come down from the ceiling and click and then someone was going to attach the reins to the bit and then the door would open and they just they knew exactly what to do. Um, they were also trained to use the bathroom in a bucket instead of making a mess in their stall or in the firehouse. And uh, so they were not only. Um, smart, but they were also really dear to both the firemen who cared for them and members of the community who would come and visit the horses and play with the horses. Um, their illnesses were chronicled in detail in, co in uh, company record books, day books, and their deaths were published in newspapers. Um, reading last night, actually, that sometimes the firemen would let the horses out of their stalls to kind of wander the neighborhoods as they pleased. Um, there was a horse at engine 14, which is right, used to be right where uh, the central library is, a block down. And this horse would go out to the bars and he would drink. Um, and when he passed, the men refused to let him go to the boneyard. So they buried him out behind the fire station. Um, there was a horse named Pat at engine nine, who, when he was given free time, would go to the French market and get fed snacks. Um, and there was a horse named Thomas O'Connor who would go graze in the nearby cemetery and steal people's straw hats. There was even a blind horse whose name was number 251, who would still work like all the other horses. He knew exactly where he needed to be, and he would just let the other horses guide him. Um, so these the horses weren't equipment. You know, they were they were firemen, they were members of the family. In June of 1918, when Pujol um, was at the helm, but under the leadership of John Ev, so Pujol started it, but under the leadership of John Evans, former assistant chief and then chief engineer of the New Orleans Fire Department from 1920 all the way through to 1945, the New Orleans Fire Department switched to an entirely motorized fleet of vehicles. As the New Orleans item put it, 
the horse has been sacrificed in the interest of speed. The last two companies to use horses were engines five and six, both on magazine, both on magazine in the warehouse district. Um, on April 22nd, 1922, the horses of engine five made the last roll for a horse-drawn engine in the New Orleans Fire Department. After they went to the fire and came back, those horses were transferred over to the stables at engine six, a few blocks away to wait and be auctioned off. The last horses at engine five were old 252, Baby, Dick, Dandy, and Big Head. In this picture, Baby is on the left and old number 252 is on the right. And the last horses over at engine six were Beauty, Buster, and Snowball. Um, on May 23rd, 1922, at engine five on Magazine Street near St. Joseph, the 25 horses still in possession of the New Orleans Fire Department were auctioned off as were their blankets and harnesses and um, all of their equipment. As the firemen watched, many of them started crying and they were hugging the horses. And at some point, some of them just had to go inside. Uh, the horse-drawn steam engines were auctioned off in June of that year. The New Orleans item said of the auction, woe betide the man who gets one of these horses and treats him cruelly. A man named L.J. Shiro bought 13 of the horses and announced that two of them, Snowball and Baby, would enjoy retirement out to pasture. This is Snowball. Um, Chief Evans said, it's heartbreaking to see these faithful horses go under the auctioneer's hammer. They are victims of the motor age. We hate to see them go. They have been a part of the department for so long. It seems a pity that these splendid fellows will soon be driving ice wagons and peddling fruit. Um, and that's where I'm ending my history of the fire department today, um, kind of last big shift in equipment, O'Connor's gone, new leadership. Um, I know it's been a little long, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm going to pass it over to Amanda. Thank you, Nikki. That was that was incredible, and that was exhaustive. And I, I, you know, I know that it's always a hit, but I do love hearing. I, I think the way that you ended discussing the horses is a wonderful way to to bring it to a close. But um, this is fabulous, and thank you for the update, Brian. Um, I'm I'm going to go ahead. Um, y'all are welcome to type questions in chat. Um, I'm also going to fix it. So um, if you would. Uh, you know, um, if you would uh, turn on your camera, uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, verbally, um, I'll, I'll call on you to ask it. But let me get back through the questions that we did get during the presentation so we can take care of them. Um, I do want to say uh, Karen opened with saying that her 96-year-old father, Edwin Hattier, or Hattier, sorry, former deputy fire chief of New Orleans was viewing today, which is amazing. Yay! <laughs> awesome. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see here. And, and George L. Bueller uh, said, this is amazing. His great, great, great grandfather was also a founding member of V3, Anton Bueller. Yay! <laughs> And then um, Tina Lowers, um, she said, I've heard stories elsewhere of refusing to put out fires at the homes of Black people. I wonder if this is a kind of situation that would lead to equipment being reappropriated, as it were. And I think that's very possible. New Orleans was also unique in that it had um, a large community of well-established free people of color and business people. So there was a level also of respectability and money that was involved that may not have been involved in other cities in America at the time. Um, there is, uh, let's see, Michelle Ernest said, did I hear correctly that we are able to research old roll books? Is it only through family search? Her grandfather was a fireman and only knows the end story with the department. Supposedly his grandfather and father were also either paid firemen or volunteers, but she doesn't have any real evidence of it. So let's see her. Her grandfather, um, well, there's the the roles that you found through the Chairman Benevolent Association, correct? And then um, at the city archives, I don't believe we have NOPD roles, but I don't know that we have NOFD roles. I'm not familiar, but let me double check really quick. 
Um, I know for me, I found we those don't. role books on family search. They're not indexed. You really have to scroll through page by page and read. Um, you can maybe guess which company they were in based upon what neighborhood they lived in. Um, but that that's through family search and that's one you go to the library to use that one. That's where mm -hmm. I found that. I have not been able to get into the Fireman's Charitable Association yet mm -hmm. to look at their archives of records and roll books. I'm very, very eager to do that. Um, so no report there, but you can use family search to go and look at the microfilm of those books. Michelle, if you're if you're not in the area or can't make it to the library, I'm about to put my uh, email address in chat. Um, if you uh, send me an email, I can see what I can find um, since I'm here at the library with the Family Search affiliate access. And that goes the same for all of everybody here for sure. Um, let's see here. What is next? Let's see here. Uh, we have, oh, Susan Barrett-Smith, who is, um, she says the Fireman's Festival um, is still an important annual event in her hometown of New Concord, Ohio. So that's oh, incredible. Nice. Awesome. I love that. The legacy is, uh, the wonderful thing I've noticed about the fire department and descendants of firemen is, is the wonderful respect and interest in history. And I think it really speaks to how, um, fighting fires really forges a sort of like brotherhood that carries through the ages. Um, Craig Henry asks, wondering about the advent of fire marks on homes in the French Quarter buildings. Um, I oh, yeah. was asked, the, asked a similar question um, when I did this presentation for Learning Before Lunch. I have not found it's in my to be researched pile. I haven't found a lot more yet. I know that there were um, basically an iron plaque and I think it had four, no, ours didn't have, it was a fire hydrant with hoses on it and they would be put up on the building so you knew that the building was insured. Right. Uh, you knew what insurance company it was. There are examples of it in the historic New Orleans collections online catalog. Um, I read where in other cities, the firemen would come to blows fighting over who got to put it out and therefore get the money and the salvage. I have not found anything about that here, possibly because it's not something O'Connor wanted to talk about or it didn't happen, but it might just be something O'Connor didn't want to talk about. It might have been contentious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that doesn't look good. Let's not put that in there. <laughs> Very possible. Um, Question, do you have any information about firemen making nets while on firehouse on call duty? Not sure of the time period, but I heard a relative long time before me and his fellow firemen did this as a side job. Like nets to catch people in? I, that's what I was wondering. Are, um, if, are you still here, Nancy? Let me check. Um, just kind of. I can see that happening just based on personal, when volunteer firemen were oh, volunteer To sell firemen. crab net, yeah. Oh, I'm- Seafood. Con confident, I'm confident. I would put money on my dad hand making crab nets at some point sitting in a firehouse. Yeah, I'm gonna go okay. Yeah, most of these guys now have a second job. Um, and especially in volunteer days, they definitely had a job that made them money. Like my people back in the day we all had grocery stores so yeah they're gonna they're if if they have free time at the firehouse they yeah yes oh yeah <laughs> and, and then brian has been updating on fires they uh the new orleans fire department is currently working a building fire at 4900 france road and Ooh. i thank you that is it's it's so it really reinforces that this is happening even as we talk about the history of it like this is happening right now and it's happening every day it's incredible and then we have a lot of thank yous um tina loves the idea of the horses wandering the city enjoying their day off oh god <laughs> and lots of great jobs thank you everybody for um for attending dana says edwin hattie our former chief enjoyed the presentation oh grace Oh, and she says she has old roll books that need to be put in the correct hands. That would be me, Janice. Um, those, <laughs> those do, in fact, belong in the city archives. Um, can I, uh, let's see here. Let me put my email address 
in here right now, again, please email me and we will work with you to get them uh, put among the collections in the city archives with the rest of the fire department books. Um, I did note during the presentation that most of our records do tend to start when they formally, um, you know, incorporated under the city. Um, but uh, we've been, as I said, uh, we've been working to collect stuff. I am currently in the midst of a uh, um, probably have another like, you know, nine to 12 months to go, but I'm processing approximately 3,500 day books that I've, I've gotten over the course of this year. And the hope is once I've processed these, they, um, they'll be, you'll get a full accounting of what houses and what years I have online. And those will be available to the public anytime by visit. We're also working on um, updating our fire department photo collection. We're getting a lot of materials from the fire museum as well. Um, but um, those roll books are invaluable. Please get in contact with me about them. Um, definitely um, would love to uh, speak with you about that. And let's see here. Um, so please, yeah, contact me, Janice. <laughs> call me. Um, and my, here's my phone number two. Um, if you call me, um, I, I am going to be at the fire museum um, on Monday, but I should be in the office on Tuesday between 10 and 5. So you can call me then too. Um, let's see here. Uh, what is next? What is next? Let's see here. Um, Karen says both my grandfathers, my father, husband, and two brother-in-laws were on the New Orleans Fire Department. Loved it. That's fabulous. Um, I, I love it. Um, <laughs> secret. My husband, my husband is in the fire department too. So <laughs> it's so many stories. They tell so many stories. I I love hearing them. I remember as a kid, you know, hearing guys talk and um God, that would be a big oral history project. That's a whole it's incredible. <laughs> I do know for a fact that um, Historic New Orleans Collection did take some oral histories about Katrina from the fire department, but they were going to keep the um, records closed for 25 years. So until I believe approximately 2030, just so people would feel free to say everything and not hold back without fear of, you know, any repercussions, you know, at any sensitive time. So in 2030, they will make those available. Um, Ronald Boulier uh, says, join late, but it was very informative. By the way, he knows your dad and is proud of your hard work. Oh, and Jeanette's you. work habits. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, Janice, yeah. And Janice again, her father made them at the firehouse as well. Um, <laughs> Hi, uh, um, Thomas. The Fire Museum is on Washington Avenue. Um, it's currently, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's by appointment only. Um, let me, if you could send me an email, I can see if I can find contact information for that. But I know um, there's only one person that is available and it's only part time because he's usually running um, school outreach and um, public relations. So that's why it's it's limited hours. Yeah, volunteer, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Nikki, or any other questions anybody has? I'm I'm good. Just again, yeah. sorry. Sorry, it went a little long. There's just so much no, information. No, it's, um, <laughs> it's so fascinating, and I'm so glad that you put it together to present to the public. I mean, it's it's wonderful to have this sort of history about all of our city agencies, and you know, I I think what you've done is pioneering, and I would I would love to see it for more more city departments. You know, if anybody out there knows anybody else in any departments that wants to do it. <laughs> Um, and, and, and for those of you who know people that weren't able to make it today, again, I will be um, putting the recording up on our YouTube channel and I will be sending everybody who registered an email once it's up. So yeah. And thank you. And thank you. Please email me, everybody. Um, I am ready to hear about any materials so we can make them available to the public. Thank you, guys. Well. Thank you again, Nikki. This was incredible. And um, I think it.
It's very important work. Yes, what Brian said, contact the NF ONOFD Public Information Department for museum de tours, yeah, yeah. And thank you. Thank you again, everybody for coming. This has been great. And I loved all the stories and questions too. It's, it's just, it's all so fascinating. But yeah, with that, I will let you guys get out and get to the good weather, everybody. <laughs> Go enjoy that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, Nikki. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.